Hey, we have been going through a series called Seven. Can someone say Seven? Seven. We've been going through this series called Seven. And so Seven, we've been going through the last seven statements of Jesus on the cross. And so if you guys can, can you guys turn with me to John chapter 19? We're going to John chapter 19. I'm going to be talking about the third statement that Jesus talked on the cross. If you guys were here for the previous two weeks, week one, Jesus, he says, hey, Father, forgive them for they not know what they do. And then on the second statement, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. And these are found in the book of Luke. But this third one, this third one is found only in the book of John. And I love this third statement. And so if you guys have your Bibles, we're in John chapter 19. If not, it will be on the screens behind me. But it reads a little something like this, starting at verse 25. It says, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Out of these few verses, I just want to preach on this third statement, which is behold your son, behold your mother. Behold your son and behold your mother. Hey, if you guys can, would you guys go ahead and pray with me? Believe that God is in this room. God is going to speak to us today. So Lord, we thank you, Jesus. God, thank you that you would allow us to come into your presence. God, thank you that you would allow us to come into a room like this where we can open scripture together, where we can pray together. God, there are places in the world that they cannot do this. This is an honor. This is something that we could take for granted, God, but it is such a privilege to be able to come together, to encourage each other, to lift each other up. God, I pray for every single person that is here today, God. I thank you that you are with them. I thank you that you are for them. I thank you that you've never left their side, God. I thank you that you are here in the room, God. I pray that you may speak through me. I pray that you just continue to do what only you could do. Thank you that the Miami Hurricanes are in the lead eight today, and they are going to win in Jesus' name. Come on, all Calvary Church says, amen. amen, amen. Come on, if you love Jesus, can you make some noise one time? So my wife and I, we just, we took a trip to St. Augustine this week. Anybody love St. Augustine? Anybody gone to St. Augustine recently? St. Augustine is absolutely gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. There are so many pretty spots in St. Augustine. But this trip, I was on a mission. I was on a mission, and I'll tell you why. Because my wife, she has a tendency to kind of make fun of me when we go on trips. I'll tell you why. My wife, she has a great gift of photography. Like, she's just so good. When we're on trips, she takes the best pictures of me. She goes and she'll get the right angles. She'll get the right backgrounds. She'll get everything. She'll get my shoes. She'll get my hair. She gets everything that you need in a picture. But me, I wasn't born with that gift. Like, I was not born with the gift of photography, right? And so my wife, she, she kind of makes fun of me about it. She goes, and she's constantly showing me the TikToks. These TikToks are of girls saying, hey, hu- pictures that I-, I take of my husband versus pictures that he takes of me. And they're always really terrible pictures. Hence, I take really terrible pictures. So she's always like, hey, when you take pictures of me, my double chin comes out, right? I'm like, what double chin? I don't even know what that means. And she's like, or my hand is in an awkward position, or I'm blinking and my eyes are closed. Yeah, photography is not in my DNA. It's not something that I'm good at. But this trip, I was on a mission. Like, I'm tired of getting made fun of. My wife makes fun of me in my own home. So I'm tired of her making fun of me. So I'm like, I'm on, I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission. This trip, I'm going to make sure I get the best photos. I'm going to make sure that the whole time I got my phone out, I'm looking for the best sceneries. I'm looking for the spots that nobody else can take. I'm looking for the best backgrounds. I'm looking for the staircases that look cool. I'm waiting for the sunset to come down. I'm waiting for her to just walk. And then at the end, she goes... I guess I can't send you TikToks anymore. You did a pretty good job. And so I was like, let's go. Let's go. But there's something about capturing a moment. There's something about getting an angle that nobody else can get. There's something about getting a scene that nobody else can get. And I love this statement on the cross because this this statement on the cross was different than the other ones, right? You can find all the statements on the cross in the Gospels between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But this one was special. This one was written by John. John, he has a special view at what's happening. He has a special angle at what's happening. He has a special glimpse, a a special standpoint that nobody else has. See, John, John, he absolutely loved Jesus. 
John, he has a great name, by the way. I, I love the name John. But John, he absolutely loves Jesus. He actually calls himself the one whom Jesus loved. Like, he loves Jesus. The book of John is a love story. It's all about how much Jesus loves us, and, and he would die for us. And he goes, and he just loves Jesus. John was a part of Jesus' inner circle. He saw things that most of the disciples didn't see. He saw things that most people didn't see. He saw Jesus transfigure. Like, he loved Jesus. John, he was actually at the Last Supper resting his head on the head, on, on the chest of Jesus. Like, this is something special. John, he loves Jesus, right? He starts off his gospel by saying, hey, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, he says, and the Word became flesh. And the Word became flesh. Like, this is powerful. He's pretty much saying anything that Jesus says is significant. Anything that Jesus says is beautiful. Anything that Jesus says is powerful because the word became flesh. The word became flesh. The word became alive. The word became real. There is power when Jesus speaks. John, he goes ahead and writes in chapter 20 why he wrote the gospel of John. He says, this is why I wrote my gospel. Jesus, he did a bunch of miracles. He did a bunch of things that, that yes, the other, you could read them in the other gospels. But the reason I wrote my gospel, he says, is so that way you could see that he is the Messiah. That way you could see he's the son of God. That way you could see that there is life in the name of Jesus. Like G John's story of John is so beautiful. And here he has a beautiful standpoint of what's happening. To John, Jesus is humanity was important. The fact that Jesus was human was so important to him. Like, think about it. We can forget sometimes, yes, Jesus was 100% God, but he was also 100% human. He was 100% human. Like, sometimes we get a headache, and we're out of commission for a week. But here, Jesus is on the cross, and he's got nails in his hands, and he's got a crown of thorns on his head, and he's been beaten, and he's been lashed, and he's been degraded. Like, imagine the pain that he's gone through. The pain that he suffered, the pain that he's had to endure, there is power in the pain that he's had to go through and the fact that he was human. And it's on, this picture, it's on this cross that John is painting this picture of what happened. It's on the cross where the soldiers, the guards, they had to actually take a moment and they, they took off all Jesus' clothes and they're starting to separate and they're, they're literally paying each other with Jesus' clothes to say, all right, a piece for you, a piece for you, a piece for you, a piece for you. And then there's one piece and they're like, okay, this one we can't tear apart. So what we're going to do is we're going to cast dice for it. So the guards, they're literally, they're literally just waging Jesus' clothes around like it's nothing. While Jesus is naked, he's, he's been degraded on this cross. And then it says, at the cross was four women, including Jesus' mother and John. Like it's beautiful. There's four women at the cross. So despite everything that's going on, there's four women, including the mother of Jesus and John, the one who wrote this book. He's got a first-hand glimpse of what's happening. He's got a first-hand glimpse of what is happening here. And here is where Jesus says that he sees his mother and he says, hey, woman, he says, behold your son. And then he turns to John and he says, behold your mother. What he's doing here is he's saying, hey, John, while I'm gone, while I'm about to leave this earth because I'm about to die, you're going to take care of my mother for me. You're going to take care of my mother for me because I'm not going to be here to do so. Here's the thing. At this time, it was the job, it was the role, it was the, what the, the oldest son was supposed to do. If the oldest son saw that the father was not around, if the oldest son saw that the husband was not around, they had to actually be in charge of taking care of the mother. He had to take care of Mary. And so it, most historians, most scholars believe that Joseph had died by the time that Jesus was a young age. And so that means it would have been Jesus' responsibility to make sure that John, to, well, to make sure that his mother was taken care of. And so he says, John take care of my mother. This is like your new adopted son. He's going to take care of you. He gave the responsibility over to John. Jesus is in pain. Jesus is suffering. And I think in this pain, in this suffering, there's so much depth that can come out of this passage. But I just want to go through a few things that have impacted me, a few things that have stuck out to me, a few things that I believe can really change our lives. And the first thing is this, and I want you to write this down. Despite his own pain, Jesus saw the pain of others. Despite his own pain, Jesus saw the pain of others. Can you remember the last time that maybe you stubbed your toe? Can you remember the last time maybe that you broke a bone? Can you remember the last time that you were sick? 
The last time, any time that I'm sick, hey, it's all about me. Like, I want to make sure that I'm good. I want to make sure that I'm getting the soup that I want. I want to make sure that I'm watching all the Netflix shows that I want to watch. I'm making sure that I'm eating everything that I want. I'm making sure the Gatorade flavor is the one that I like. Like, it's all about me. I want the medicine to make me feel better. I'm not caring about anybody else. My wife can do the cooking. My wife can do the cleaning. I'm not doing anything while I'm sick. But imagine Jesus. Picture this moment of Jesus on the cross. Again, he's got this crown of thorns on his head. He's probably dehydrated because he has not drank anything. He probably can't even breathe much because of the fact that his whole body is weighing him down and he's got these na nails in his hands. Like Jesus is in pain. And it's there that he says, he, Jesus sees his mother. Yeah. Wow. He, he saw his mother. Like, can you imagine for a moment what Mary might have been going through? Can you imagine the pain that she must have been dealing with? Like we remember Jesus' pain, what he might be doing. But can you imagine the pain of a mother? The one who held Jesus in her stomach for nine months. The one who gave birth to Jesus around animals in a manger. The one who, when Jesus probably scraped his knee because he's human as a kid, was there to comfort him, was there to be by his side. Now Mary is seeing her son on this cross, helpless, and she can't do anything about it. The pain of a mother. Can you imagine what she's dealing with? what she's going through, what she's facing. And it's when Jesus is on the cross that John says he saw his mother who might not be going through the same physical pain that he's going through, but is going through an emotional pain, who is going through a spirit, a pain on the inside that is indescribable. But here's the thing. I think we tend to department pain. We tend to put pain in boxes and we tend to say, hey, no one understands the pain that I'm going through because the pain that I'm going through is bigger than everybody else's. And the hurt that I'm going through is bigger than the hurt that anybody else is going through. And so no one understands me. And so we isolate ourselves and we put ourselves in a box and we say, hey, I, I can't talk to anybody because they won't understand what I'm going through. They won't understand that I just lost a friend. They won't understand that I just lost my parent. I'm, pa I'm in pain. Yep. Pain is pain. And yes, hurt is hurt. But sometimes you, you need to stop comparing your pain to the person next to you. Just because you feel like you, the situation you're going through is bigger and deeper, it doesn't mean that somebody can't sympathize with you, that somebody can't empathize with you. I promise you that pain is pain. I love doing student ministry and youth ministry because sometimes you're talking to a middle schooler and to them, what is the biggest deal in the entire world? You're like, bro, like that's not a big deal. Like, come on, like I understand you lost your video game this week. There's no need to cry about it. But... We could do the same. Imagine if Jesus saw his mother and was like, why are you crying? Why are you hurt? I'm the one that's up here bleeding for you. I'm the one that's up here going through the pain for you. Imagine if Jesus said that. Imagine he was just like, Psh. like, mom, what are you doing? Like, get over yourself. I'm the one that's in real pain. I'm the one that's really suffering. But Jesus didn't compare his pain to his mother's. Jesus knew that pain was pain. Jesus knew that even though her, she, her, he was in physical pain, her pain was different. Her pain was something else. See, there's something interesting about this statement on the cross. This statement on the cross was the only statement that didn't probably have to be made on the cross. If you look at all seven statements, if you look at all the statements that appeared on the cross, all the other six, they could have been made at, uh, they were only there on the cross. They could have only been done on the cross. But this one statement, it could have been done at any time. If you look at the first two, right? As Jesus says, hey, Father, forgive them for they not know what they do. It makes sense as they just hung up Jesus on a cross, as they just put him in between two criminals, and he's just saying, hey, Father, forgive them for they not know what they do. It makes sense on the cross. The second statement, as Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. It makes sense because he's talking to a criminal and the criminal says, hey, Jesus, remember me, right? And so these two statements on the cross, all the other ones, it is finished. I'm thirsty. They make sense on the cross. But this one, as Jesus is telling John to take care of his mother, this could have happened at any single point. This could have happened before. This could have been said before. Literally, at the Last Supper, John was laying his head on the chest of Jesus. He could have literally just been like, hey, by the way, um, I'm about to die, and I need you to take care of my mom while I'm gone. And John probably would have been shocked, but he would have been like, okay, I, I get it. They're already together. Like, he could have said this before. It could have said, been said after. When Jesus resurrected, Jesus was literally hopping into people's homes. He was walking through walls, like, just stepping in. And he's like, hey, I'm going to come in. Un he could have done the same thing to John, just walked in his house and been like, hey, um, uh, your boy's clearly a ghost right now. And so uh, I need you to take care of my mom while I'm gone. It probably would have even made more sense. But Jesus, he says this on the cross. He says this on the cross, and you tend to think, why would Jesus say this on the cross? Why would Jesus mention this on the cross? He could have said this at any point, but I believe that there's a significance behind it. 
I believe that there's a significance because Jesus is saying, yes, on the cross, I came to give you eternal life. Yes, on the cross, I came for your salvation, but I need you to know that on the cross, I also care about your personal needs. I also care about what you're dealing with right now. He says, hey, you might be going through a situation right now, but I care about your medical report. I care about your son that is far away from Jesus. I care about the cancer that just appeared in your body. I care about everything that you might be going through. He cares about your needs. It was when Jesus was on the cross, when Jesus is facing the biggest pain of his entire life, that it says that he sees his mother. He sees his mother. I need you to know, Calvary Church, that Jesus, he sees you too. He sees you in this room. He sees your pain. He sees your suffering. He sees your tears at night. He sees the things that you haven't told anybody that you've been dealing with. He sees the suffering that you've had to go through. He sees the things that you've been holding on to, the grudges that you've been holding on to. He sees everything. And he just says, hey, I need you to know that I see you. It was one look, one glance at his mom, one glance. It was one look that changed everything. One look that changed, one trajectory, changed the trajectory of Mary's life. I need you to know that he sees you. And it's that one look that could change your life forever. He sees you, he sees you, he sees you. When I worked at FIU, there was a sign that you would see often that said, if you see something, say something. Anybody ever seen a sign like this? You'll see them at airports, you'll see them all over the place. If you see something, say something. And so this was pretty much what this is saying is, hey, if you see something that's suspicious, we need you to say something to authorities. You just can't, you just can't hold it to yourself. You just can't keep it in. You just can't let, you actually have to do something about it. See, what I love is that Jesus, he didn't just see his mother but then he acted upon it. Then he spoke into her life. I need you to write this down. Jesus spoke into the pain of others. Jesus spoke into the pain of others. He didn't just see his mother from far away. He didn't just see her at her pain, but then he does something about it. See, honestly, I could forgive Jesus if Jesus didn't do anything about it. Like if he just saw his mom, it's like, all right, I understand like Jesus, he's on the cross. Like, he, like Jesus, you're going through a lot of pain. I understand if you don't do something about it right now, but it says there right after it says, woman, Behold your son. This is Jesus talking. He says, woman, behold your son. Well, let's pause there for a second. I love my mom. My mom is amazing. She is the sweetest. She's up here in the front. She's the sweetest, kindest lady on the entire planet, if you've ever met her. But if I called my mom woman, like if I was like, woman, my mom would probably not hit me hard, but she'd probably slap my arm a little bit. Like to say, to call her mom woman, like it sounds degrading. It sounds disrespectful, but at this time, the word woman, it actually wasn't a disrespectful term. It wasn't a degrading term. It was actually a respectful term. It was a term that was often used for, to address a lady, but it was not something that you would honestly address your mom as. You wouldn't usually call your mom woman, but there's actually two times that Jesus calls his mom woman. The first time is right at the beginning of his ministry, right at the start. Jesus is at a wedding with his family. They're all there. They're all partying. They're all celebrating because Jesus, you know, he gets wild. He gets crazy. Crazy, Jesus, I'm just kidding. But Jesus, he, he's at this party. He's at this party and it goes and, it, and they run out of wine at this party. To run out of wine at a party, it was a big deal at this time. Like you can literally get fined. You can literally go through some, some trouble if you ran out of wine at a party. And so they run out of wine and Jesus' mother, Mary, she goes, hey, just, just talk to Jesus right there. He's got you. And that's where Jesus says, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not come yet. At the very start of his ministry, he calls his mother woman. But then there's a second time, and it's right here on the cross, at the very start of his ministry, and then at the very end of his ministry. Why is this significant? Why is it significant that he called his mother woman? This is significant because the word woman, he's actually separating himself from his earthly mother to say, hey, I am now doing the will of my heavenly father. I can't do your will anymore. I can't do what you've asked me to do. I have to do what is right. I have to do what my heavenly father is doing. And I think this is significant in this passage because as he's separating himself, it's easy to look at this and say, of course, Jesus would do this for his mom. Like, I love my mom. I would do anything for my mom. And it's easy to say, of course, Jesus would see his mom. But him separating himself from his mom and saying, hey, I would do this for anybody, including you. Jesus, he would have seen you no matter what. He would have seen you where you are. And not only would he have seen you, but he would have spoken life into your situation too. He would have done what only you, he can do. See, and I really think it shows us this. 
that even when Jesus was at his weakest point, he still was willing and still was able and still anointed to help others. Church, I need you to know that even when you are weak, you can still help others. Even when you are weak, you can still help others. And I understand that you might be going through some pain in this moment. I understand that you might be going through hurt. I understand that life has probably not looked the way that you wanted it to go. Life has probably seemed impossible and you think I am way too weak to help anybody. I am way too, I've gone through too many struggles to help anybody in my life. But it was at Jesus' weakest point that he was still anointed to help those around him. Church, you might be weak, but you are still anointed to help the people around you. You are still called to help the people around you. You have been gifted. You have been called by God to help the very people around you. You might have neglected responsibilities because of the pain. You might have neglected your family because of your hurt. You might have neglected all the things that you're supposed to be doing, the people at your workplace. You've been rude. You've been disrespectful. And I'm sure it's probably caused you to be angry, bitter, judgmental, just anxious, depressed. I'm not, de I'm not degrading what you've gone through. But what I'm saying is that even at your weakest point, you can still help somebody in this room. You can still help somebody at your workplace. You can still help somebody in the very vicinity that God has allowed you to be in. He's given us a responsibility. He's given us a responsibility. He's called us to do so. He's called us to replicate him. Jesus, he sees you and he's working. He sees you and he's working. And here's the thing, it might not be the way that you wanted it to be. Jesus working, it might not be the way that you want it to be. See, I think Mary probably, if it were up to her, he, she would have wanted Jesus to take care of her for the rest of her life. But Jesus, he, he chose John. This is crazy because John was actually the only disciple that died a natural death due to old age. Every other disciple was either killed, martyred, or persecuted for their faith to the point where they died at an earlier age. But John was the only one who lived to old age. So Jesus knew that John would actually be able to take care of her. Jesus was working. Jesus was working. It didn't seem like it. It didn't feel like it. it. Might not have been the way that Mary wanted, but Jesus was working. I need you to know that Jesus is working in your life too. He's working in your life too. It might not be the way that you expected it. It might not be the way that you would have wanted it. It might seem like, hey, there's no way that a God who loves me would make me go through the things that I'm going through. There's no way that a God who cares for me would go ahead and allow me to go through these situations. But Jesus, he is working. He is moving. He is moving in your life. He sees you. He is speaking life into you. And he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I see you. I see you. And I absolutely love you. Loves you. But then there's also a sense of responsibility that has to come out of this too. We can't just see things anymore and allow them to keep going. We can't just see people that are hurting. We can't just see people that are pain and allow them to keep hurting, allow them to stay in pain and not let them know that there is a God who loves them, that there is a God who cares for them, that there is a God who sees them too. Love what James, the brother of Jesus, writes. He says, my brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? Check this out. In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. Wow. Faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. What James is telling us is that when we see something, we're not doing something about it, we're not saying something about it, our faith is not resulting in faithful activity. Like this is powerful. We have an obligation to live out the very faith that Jesus has demonstrated for us. Jesus, he showed us this. He showed this firsthand that even at his weakest point, that he could still see. They even probably blood down his eyes, he could still see one glance. But not only just see, but he could still speak. He could still move. He could still work. He is not done working. What does is, what is caring for somebody look like in your context? What does caring for somebody look like in your home? What does caring for somebody look like in your workplace? What does caring for somebody look like in your life? Is it maybe financially supporting somebody's groceries because they can't afford it? 
is it maybe calling somebody that has been far from God and somebody that maybe you got into an argument years ago with and there's just been bitterness and there's been hostility. Is that what caring for somebody looks like in your life? Or is it maybe seeing a young person that you know has a call, has a potential, and you're saying, hey, I'm going to take them under my wing. I'm going to mentor them. I'm going to care for somebody. What does caring for somebody look like in your context? You know yourself. You know your workplace. You know your home. You know your family. You know the people that you've maybe deserted, the people that you've left. It might look different for you. For John, the writer of this gospel, it came when Jesus said, hey, woman, behold your son and behold your mother. I, I'm asking myself, why would Jesus tell John to do this? Why would Jesus ask of John to be able to do this, to take care of his Did you know that Jesus had brothers and sisters, plural? Yes, we read, a, we read a passage from one of the brothers, but he had brothers and sisters. Like, why would, why would Jesus ask John to do this? It, it makes no sense. Like, he might be one of those friends that you say, hey, that's my brother. Like, I love that guy. But they, they weren't blood brothers. They weren't blood. Why would Jesus ask John to take care of his mother? Well, I think it comes at the, what we see at the start of this passage. It says, but standing by the cross of Jesus. But standing by the cross of Jesus. But standing by the cross of Jesus. Could the answer be that there is something about being near the cross? Could the answer be that there must be something about standing by the cross? Church, I need you to know that today we can draw near the cross. Every single one of us, we can draw near the cross. I know it sounds cliche. I know it's something you've heard all the time. Run to the cross. Lead me to the cross. And we, you've heard Pastor Alex talk about it. Hey, uh, we always want to celebrate Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. But the cross, hey, the cross is dark. The cross is heavy. There's something I don't want to run to. It's something that I don't want to be a part of. To carry my own cross. Uh, that's, hey, that's a lot. But if it were not for the cross, we would still be in bondage. If it were not for the cross, we would not be forgiven. If it were not for the cross, we would not have salvation. If it were not for the cross, then we would still be broken in our sin and we would still be dead in our sin. The cross has power. The cross has significance. It's why James, the brother of Jesus, he writes, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We can draw near the cross. I was thinking about how one day, I'm in a rush to head home. I'm heading from work and I'm like, hey, I gotta get home real quick. And so I'm driving fast, speed limit, of course, because I would never go above speed limit. And so I'm driving, I'm driving pretty fast and I cut off a car. Yes, I'm a pastor and I cut off cars sometimes. And so I cut off this car and I'm, following, I'm going and I see that this car is heading in the same direction as me. And I'm like, oh no. I hope they're not going to say, they're going to my neighborhood and they're a resident too. And they go into the same neighborhood. I'm like, oh my gosh. Then I go ahead and I park in my parking spot and they park in the parking spot right next to me. You ever done something wrong? And you just like, I don't want this person to see what I look like. I'm in a rush, but I'm just going to lower my seat. I'm just going to stay back. I got tinted windows. Good thing. So they can't see who I am. I was embarrassed because I knew I had done something that I shouldn't have done. Well, John, the writer of this gospel, he had done something that he shouldn't have done. He had done something wrong. He had done something. Check this out. It was when Jesus had just gotten arrested. Jesus had just gotten arrested. He's, he's about to go on the cross and he needs his friends. He needs the people around him. It says in Mark chapter 14, he says, then everyone deserted him and fled. Man, then everyone deserted him and, and fled. This must have been a huge deal for John. Remember, John was the one whom Jesus loved. John loved Jesus. John loved everything about Jesus. John was like, I'm all for Jesus. I'll, never, I'll put my head on your chest. Like, I'm right by your side. I got you, bro. Like, I'm with you. And he says that he deserted him and fled. When Jesus needed his friends the most, when Jesus needed his people the most, they all deserted him. They all fled. I could just imagine John. He's probably holding on to this and it's like, man, I can't even, Jesus, I, I don't even want Jesus to look at me right now. I'm so embarrassed of what I've done. I'm so embarrassed of this moment that I've been in. I'm so embarrassed to be here. And he's like, I hope Jesus doesn't even see me. But it's on this moment where it says, but standing by the cross. But standing by the cross was John. It was the four women, including his mother. And it was John. John, he loved Jesus. 
He had deserted Jesus, but that love drew him back to the cross. And it was on the cross where I believe right here in this one statement, Jesus shows the whole gospel. And it was when, G when John had fled, when John had deserted him, he still says, hey, John, I forgive you. It was on the cross, even though he had left him, he says, hey, John, I still give you a responsibility. It was on this cross, he says, hey, I will show you that there is life beyond here because there is significance in the cross. It was at the cross where John's life was changed forever. John's life was changed forever. And all it took was for John to draw back to the cross, to come back to the cross. Church, I need you to know that you can come back to the cross. I don't know what your life has looked like. I don't know what you've been holding on to. You might feel like you have been a million miles away from God. You might feel like I am so far away. I am so far away. You are only just a few steps from just drawing back to the cross. What are you, whatever you've been carrying, Jesus says, hey, just, just draw back to the cross. Just come back. Do you feel like you've been holding guilt? Have you been holding shame? Have you been holding unforgiveness? Draw back to the cross. Have you been saying, hey, I don't know what my life looks like. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what responsibilities I'm supposed to have. You can come back to the cross. I don't know what your life has looked like today, but I promise you the answer is in the cross. The answer is in what Jesus did for you on the cross. It was on the cross when John was far away, when John had fled, when John had abandoned him, that Jesus said, hey, I give you forgiveness, I give you responsibility, and I give you life after my death. There's power in the cross. What was supposed to be the end, what was supposed to be the final, was the start. It was the start for you. The cross is the start for you. The cross is where you can let everything go. It's at the cross where you can let your past go. It's at the cross where you can say, I'm, I, I don't want to be the same old person that I was. I want to let go of some things. I want to let go of the person that I've been. I want to let go of the mistakes that I've made. I want to let go of the things that I've never told anybody. I want to let go of all this shame. I want to let go of all this guilt. I want to let go of this health issue. I want to let go of my mental health issue. I want to let go of everything, but it's going to take us to come back to the cross. We got to take us to come back to the cross. It's at the cross where your life can be transformed forever. Come on, somebody. Can you give Jesus some praise in this room? It's at the cross. You could go. I don't know where you've been today. I don't know where you find yourself today, but it's at the cross. John called himself the one whom Jesus loved. John, I'm pretty sure Jesus loved every disciple that left him. Jesus even loved the people that crucified him. But it was John saying, hey, I know my God loves me, that's gonna draw me back to the cross. You need to know in this room that Jesus loves you. And it's because of that love that you can come back to the cross today. You can come back to the cross today. Life starts for you today. Hey, can we just lift up our hands for a moment while we're standing? You need to know that Jesus, yes, he cares about your salvation, Yes, he cares about you being saved and he wants to see you in heaven with him, but he cares about your personal needs too. He cares about what you're struggling with in this place. He cares about what you're dealing with. And so whatever you're carrying, hey, let's give it up to Jesus right now. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that you are gracious, God. We thank you that you've never left us, that you've never forsaken us, God. Thank you that it was on the cross that you still saw us, God. You saw our circumstance. You saw our condition. You saw our pain. You saw our hurt, God. You saw the things that we've been carrying. You saw our illnesses, God. And you said, hey, I see you and I speak life into you, God. Lord, right now we give to you everything. Lord, we give to you everything, Jesus. We give you our pain. We give you our suffering. We give you our hurts, God, because we know that you care, because we know that we can draw near to you, God. And as we draw near to you, you draw near to us, God. I pray for anybody in this place who is dealing with illness, God. Maybe for somebody who just died, got diagnosed with cancer, for somebody who has a stomach issue, for somebody who has a pain in their body, God. I pray that it is by your stripes that we are healed, God. Lord, we pray that you may bring healing, God. The same Jesus that was healing when in the four Gospels is the same Jesus that is healing in this room. Is the same Jesus that is healing today, God. So we declare healing over bodies in this place, God. I pray for anybody who's dealing with mental health issues, anybody who's dealing with anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, God. I pray that you start to work in mental health issues, God. I pray for the person who is just far from God, for the one who has lost their child, for the one who has lost somebody and just has the 
pain of losing a family member. God, I pray that you comfort them, that you be with them, God. For the person that is just far from Jesus, far, far from you, God, I pray that you bring them back and you open them with arms wide open, that you're not judging, that you're not far away, but you say, I love you, I care for you, God. I pray that anybody who's just discouraged, who's not knowing what's happening in their life, that they don't know what they're purposes that they're what they're supposed to be doing on this earth that they can find responsibility they can find purpose in what you've done that they can find purpose in the one who gives us purpose the one who designed us for a purpose the one has called us for a purpose God we give it all to you Jesus and we lift up our hands and we worship you one more time and we give you everything come on church let's sing this out one more time with everything that we got come on Lord, we sing. He is church i'm gonna ask if everybody could just close their eyes and bow their heads for one moment if you're in this room and you've been hearing this message you've been hearing about this jesus and you've been hearing about this person that loves you and he sees you and he speaks life into you and you're saying i don't know who this is i don't know this savior that you're talking about i don't know this jesus or maybe you knew him a long time ago and you're walking into this room and you're full of guilt and you're full of shame and you're, you're full of all these weight that you've been carrying and jesus i just need to let you know that jesus he sees you and he loves you so much. As a matter of fact, he loves you so much. There's a price for our mistakes. There's a price for our sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin, the penalty of sin is death. Like that's what every single one of us deserves. And Jesus, he sees that. He sees your situation and says, hey, I love them so much that I will pay the ultimate price for them. And so he came onto this earth and he suffered like any single one of us. The reason we can, uh, we can relate to Jesus is because Jesus knows what pain is. Jesus knows what suffering is. Maybe you're here and you're dealing with pain maybe you're dealing with suffering Jesus he sees it he says hey I can relate I've gone through more pain and more suffering than you ever have to go to so that way you can know that I love you and Jesus he came on a cross and he says hey I will pay that price of sin for you but Jesus didn't just die on the cross Jesus didn't just stay dead but three days later he resurrected and is alive today he's alive today and he says I love my people I love everybody in this room and all you need to do is just have a relationship with me if you're in this room and you're saying hey I don't know this God I want to know that I can be forgiven I want to know that I can let go of this weight that I've been carrying I want to know that I can let go of this shame that I've been carrying I want to let go of everything that that's been going on I feel alone I feel like I'm by myself and I just need to know that I'm forgiven I need a second chance if that's you in this room with no eyes looking and, and with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm just gonna ask that I'm gonna count to three and that you just lift up your hand. And it's just, it's not this prayer that's gonna save you, it's just all you're doing is, hey, I'll, that's me. I just wanna be prayed for. So if that's you, on the count of three, I'm just gonna ask you to lift up your hand. One, two, three. Amen. God bless you. 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 God bless you over here. God bless you in the back over here. God bless you over here. Amen. Amen. Can you keep your hands lifted for one moment for those who just raise their hand? God bless you over here. Amen. God bless you in the back. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, if you just made that decision to follow Jesus today, I just wanna let you know you just made the greatest decision of your entire life. There, you're gonna make millions of decisions and that is the greatest one that you will ever make. I promise you, from this day forward, yet life is not always gonna be easy. I'm not promising you or guaranteeing you that life is gonna be easy, but what you do have now is you don't have to keep carrying some of the things that you've been carrying. You are forgiven. You are saved beyond this earth. Right now, you might be going through pain and suffering, but there is life beyond this. There is eternal life where you, there is no more pain. There is no more suffering. There is nothing but love and intimacy with the Father. Making that decision today is the greatest decision. And so if that's you, um, everybody's going to repeat a prayer after me. And again, it's not this prayer that saves you. But we do believe that in Romans it says, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so I'm just helping you with this first prayer. And so everybody's going to go ahead and they're going to repeat this after me as we say, Dear Jesus, I open my heart. To, I invite you inside to be my friend, 
to be my Savior, to be my God. Jesus, I'm sorry for everything that I've done. I just want to follow you all the days of my life. Jesus, I put my hope in you. I put my trust in you. And I give you everything. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, all Calvary Church says. Come on, can we make some noise for everybody who just made a decision today? We're so honored to celebrate this moment with you. Seriously, if you made a decision, we wanna give you a free gift. We wanna give you a free Bible and you can get one right in the front. And all we're doing here is just saying, hey, this is literally the mouth of God. This is literally the words of God. And sometimes we could keep his mouth closed in our life. Go get a Bible, I promise you. You want God to speak to you? Start in his word. It's the biggest way he speaks today. He speaks in a lot of ways, but his word is where he starts. And so thank you, Rich. And so go ahead and get a Bible if you made a decision to follow Jesus um, today. And so, hey, we're also gonna, we have Baptism Sunday happening today. Back to Sunday, some of my favorite Sundays. And so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna play one more song here today. And while the band is playing this last song, I'm gonna ask if uh, if you are getting baptized during this song, go ahead and you could go get changed. We got a shirt for you. We got a towel for you. Um, even if you didn't register, it doesn't matter. Just head to the table. We wanna go ahead and make sure that we get you what you need. Amen? Amen. Hey, let's leave here praying one more time. The church is gonna lead, the band is gonna lead us in one more song and we'll go ahead and leave it. So Lord, we thank you, Jesus. God, thank you that you've chosen us. Thank you that you've forgiven us. Thank you that you've called us, Lord. We give you everything. We give you our lives, God. Thank you that you didn't just see us, but you spoke into us too. God, allow us to be your hands and feet every single day of our lives. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I love you, church.